Hey, it's Liz D'Alto, and this is the Untame the Wild Soul Woman podcast. From body image, sex, spirituality, money and relationships, to motherhood, creativity, business, communication, and desire, Untame the Wild Soul Woman is the place to come for real stories and powerful advice to help you reclaim and redefine womanhood in the 21st century. Elizabeth D'Alto here, your host for the Untame the Wild Soul Woman podcast. And I know I say all the time, every time I introduce someone, how excited I am. But this is one of my oldest and dearest friends. Um, you know how you have those friends who you might not talk to them all the time. You don't even see them that often. But when their name pops up on your phone, you just lose your shit because you're so excited. Um, this is John Roman for me. John and I go way back. I met John when I was 19 years old, slinging blades, selling Cutco knives, which many of you have heard me talk about before. Uh, this is someone who I consider a mentor, a friend, and, and it's been so fun to see how we've grown up in life, in business, and, and I'm so excited to have him here on the show. Um, I was on his podcast. We'll link that up. Um, this this is a person who I just we were talking before uh, we we hit the record button and, and I'm just laughing and giddy and excited and we were just saying how like talking to each other like kind of feels like we're on drugs so <laughs> God only knows where this conversation is gonna go so buckle up don't have any expectations and um, let's welcome John Broman to the show hi friend uh, Liz it's so cool being with you this is. This is definitely going to be my favorite moment of the day by far. Um, my favorite moment, we'll see. You're competing with an old man wearing a I hope you like animals because <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a beast t-shirt that I passed on my morning walk. But I have high, I have high hopes for you. Um, by the way, everyone listening, um, John is also the founder of the Front Row Foundation. Um, incredible charity, doing amazing work in the world, creating experiences for people who are with terminal illnesses he is currently writing a book called the front row factor and he's a speaker he travels all over he's been doing this for years an amazing coach fun fact john was actually my very first life coach back in 2009 so uh oh my god all right first question what do you love about being a man what do i love about being a man all right you you um this isn't a softball you come out with the good one right off the bat come out hot what I love about being a man is the opportunity to be inspired by women. <laughs> I, I, I really believe that. I'm so deeply inspired by uh, women like you, Liz, my wife, uh, great women leaders, um, and those who may not be defined you know, um, maybe more typically as a leader, but people in my life, like my mother, who is a stay-at-home mom, who is just somebody that I think is a tremendous um, uh, player in my life, in my world. So what I like about being me is I like being surrounded by and inspired by women. And I really appreciate that. I, I also think, I want to add this too, Liz, that what I like about being a man now is very different than what I liked about being a man earlier in life. And I think that as I've grown and as I've evolved, um, I've really stepped into some masculine energy that I didn't embrace at a younger age and I could say that's a long story and a long journey of, of growing up into what I'm now 40 but I will tell you that uh, embracing some masculine energy that I didn't know that I had uh, in the last five to ten years has been very powerful I want to know more about that so I have, I have two two things I want to unpack from what you just said so first how did you discover this new and this different masculine energy? Like, what was the impetus in your life that made you go, oh, there's an entirely different experience available to me? Sure. Well, to me, it was it was Tony Robbins. Uh, back in 2003, it was a typical story. I found the CDs. It was late night. I ended up learning so much that I went to one of his live events. That led me to what was a dozen live events. And in that process, being exposed to the idea of masculine and feminine energy, I just had a label now. I had this awareness. There was light shed on this subject that I had never explored. So watching it being uh, demonstrated on stage or yeah. talked about in small groups, that was powerful. You know? And so there, there, I don't know if you've seen this before, uh, this example, perhaps you've experienced it yourself. Um, and I don't know how many events you've been to with I've Tony. I've been to one UPW. Okay, cool. So this is a typical a date with destiny thing where he brings uh, these ladies up on stage 
and he brings men up on stage and he and he's talking about their wallets and their purses and he talks about and he has them dance and interact with each other and it's wild but you see it unfold before your very eyes and i always felt that embracing my masculine energy liz was going to be somehow um it was dominating it was forceful it was it was something that was imposing on others versus this masculine energy that deals with certainty and uh, protection and allowing people to feel like allowing my wife to fully express her feminine energy at the highest level shows up when I'm at my masculine core uh, operating from total certainty. So when it's been fun. When you said the word certainty, I actually like, I, if anyone's watching, my shoulders probably dropped like an inch and a half, two inches. That's, mm. that is so, such a powerful, like that stability, that foundation, that structure of the masculine is so amazing. And, and actually something I super admire about you, I was, I was thinking about this interview as I was going on my morning walk and I'm, I'm reading a book by Alison Armstrong right now uh, called The Queen's Code. And one of the things she's talking about is like men as providers and, and all the different things that men provide. Because I think culturally, one of the only ways that men get valued and recognized as providers is financially. And I was thinking about how you provide so much for so many people. I mean, you obviously do provide for your family, um, you know, home, shelter, financially. You provide these experiences for people. You provide guidance. You speak. You provide leadership, mentorship. Like, you provide so much for the world. And, like, that's a super amazing masculine quality. I really appreciate that about you. So um, the other thing you said earlier was being inspired by women. How do you experience that? Like, how do you know when you're being inspired by a woman? And what does that do for you? Mm. Well, I, I think my biology says, I mean, and I'm married to a woman. Yeah. And I always tell Tatiana that if, you know, that I, I'm inspired by lots of women, which the biology uh, within me just allows me to feel charged. I, like I'm a, I'm a flirt now. And what's interesting is Yeah, you that, are. You are great like, at that. <laughs> Tatiana, you know, I remember her mom coming from Russia and she lives with us six months out of the year. And my flirting is really an energy exchange. Yeah. Like so many times my flirting is not, there's no, uh, there's no, uh, there's no uh, intent behind it that yeah. wouldn't be of high integrity. Right. It's literally just playfulness. Mm -hmm. My flirtatiousness is playfulness. It's saying you're a human, I'm a human. I'm going to flirt with you because this makes life fun, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and there's boundaries to that, of course. Yeah, I yeah. think everybody, you'd almost have to define what flirting really is. And for me, it's just being super engaging or friendly or interested, you know, uh, and, and without any other intent other than having a connection, a, a micro moment of love, as I recently heard somebody describe Ooh, it. Oh, I like that. You know, um, oh, that that's it. That's it. I just listened to this guy's show. It was, his name's Akeem. He wrote a book called The Moment. It's It was fantastic. So uh, to me, and, and Liz, I'm going to go back to this mother-in-law comment yep, for a yep, second because yep, yep. she came down and she said, hey, John's, John, she tell, Tatiana tells me later that her mother made a comment that John was really flirting with this person. And Tatiana goes, oh, you, you have, to have to get to know John. He will flirt with everybody. <laughs> Women, men of all <laughs> sizes, it ain't like everybody. And I think that's just how we define that term. But in particular uh, with women, you know, women light me up. Um, they, they bring so much light and energy. Uh, and, and I will tell you that as a younger man, I think that I probably was more susceptible to what the world told me were the women that should light me up. Mm -hmm. I was being marketed to and and that pure pressure of like, this is the type of woman that should light you up versus learning about what really is true feminine energy and what really lights a man up. And that to me is something that I have enjoyed experiencing over time. And it's just like learning to tap into the intricacies of life, the nuances and the details um, that make anything seem a lot more amazing once you understand it, like art, or if you've ever strapped on a pair of ice skates, you have so much more respect for it. So the, the more that I get to know about women, the more I'm, I'm just amazed at how different we are uh, how different the energy can be and how much I can learn 
uh, from from women as well. Um, and yeah, and as someone who is has been on the receiving end of your flirtation, there's no sexual charge behind it. It's just it's fun, which makes it feel safe, right? Because mm. there there's there was never any question of like intention or or anything like that. And I think that's a big thing for women. Like women need to feel safe. And totally. to be able, I think, as you were saying that, I'm like, oh, yeah, like, that's why you light me up so much, because it's so fun and it's so playful and so safe. And mm. I never have to, like, question or worry about anything. And with, with a lot of men, there there is that feeling, like, intuitively, like, eh, what does he want from me? And there's never any feeling of, like, oh, John wants something from me. Um, so that's awesome. And congratulations on being a person who, you know, other people can feel that way around, because I know that takes some personal work. You know, Liz, I want to I make a comment on that, too. Uh, I have a friend. Uh, her name is Stacy Martino, and she does relationship coaching. I was at one of her events uh, one time, and she said, all, all the ladies in the room, if you felt that your life was in danger in the last week, raise your hand. In the last day, if you felt like you were walking to your car and you were looking over your shoulder, you know, just aware of your environment, a little cautious, raise your hand. Uh, ladies, if you were in your house and you thought <laughs> you heard a noise or whatever, it, just raise your hand. And hands kept going up repeatedly. And then she's like, guys, uh, in the last year, has there ever been a moment <laughs> when you felt like your life was in danger and not a single hand went up yeah. in the room? And now that may be guys being a little like, you know, a little boastful. But I will tell you that that was a very powerful demonstration of how um, also certainty or security mm -hmm. uh, is really important. And I'll, I'll add one more thing to this, Liz, because I'm really passionate about this subject. And I promise I, will, I won't dominate. I will let you no, <laughs> chime in. No, this is what it's for. Go ahead. Uh, but I, I want to tell you that something at that event um, with my friend Stacy happened between Tatiana and I. And that was when I really started thinking about Tatiana's security and her safety and how that was showing up in our relationship and how I could create a safety for her. Now, I recognize that Tatiana's father left her when she was very young. So he is not around right now. We actually don't know where he is. Um, and so there is a bit of a, um, when might you leave me that exists within her. And so that day it hit me that the certainty or security or safety that I can provide is something that nobody else in this world can provide to her. So when we went up to the room on a break, I, I grabbed her and I looked at her and I said, I want you to know something. I want you to know that I will never, ever, ever leave you. And I said, I don't care what you do. I don't care if you cheat on me. I don't care if you hurt me. I don't care what you say to me. I will never leave you. And she just lost it. lost it. And then she said something, Liz, that is more profound than anything that I might have said up until this point. And she said, if you never told me any other words for the rest of my life, but you just told me that, I would be the happiest woman in the world. And that was a defining moment of our relationship because I realized that all the other things I could have said or done or provided for her um, didn't mean as much as that security and safety and protection that doesn't make her weak. It makes her strong that she could communicate that. It makes our relationship strong. It makes our partnership strong. And so that was a strengthening moment for us that we'll never forget. So interesting. I was doing a podcast interview yesterday with my friend Cassandra Bodzak, which in terms of the schedule, it may or may not be out before or after this one when it goes up. And one of the things we were talking about is, you know, in the year 2016, the dynamics of the roles that men and women play in culture are just like so different than they were, you know, even 20, 50, 100 years ago. And she was saying how interesting it was with her girlfriends. You know, a lot of us a lot of people who we know are entrepreneurs or have their own businesses or are just like successful people or at least just driven and career oriented. And she was saying how interesting it was in the conversations with many of her close female friends, how they're so encouraging about, oh, I, I, I want to write a book or I want to do this thing in my business or I want to launch this program. But then when someone who's single is like, I want to be in a relationship it, the response is like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Let's, why don't you create space for that? It'll mm -hmm. happen when it happens. So it's almost like 
it's just so interesting how that used to be the primary focus of an adult woman is like get married, like find your security that way. But now it's like find your own security. And it creates these very interesting dynamics because men who are literally hardwired biologically, like you were saying, to be the providers, to be the protectors, that role has kind of been stripped away and women take it on themselves. And I think it's confusing for everyone involved. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're totally right. I, th I think you're absolutely right, 100%. And, and I think that um, learning what lights us up truly and trying to put blinders on to all the advertising and promoting, mm -hmm. uh, pe peers are wonderful um, when they help us connect to what's Im most important within us. And peers and our friends can sometimes be uh, stifling in our growth when they tell us, you should do this, you should do that. Uh, this is what's right. This is what's, I mean, that. We have to be really careful um, about what we're allowing to creep in to our yeah. belief system and and also noticing how the evolution of the world is causing our belief system to shift and change. Yeah. It's fun. It's why this podcast matters so much. Thank you're talking you. about it. You're bringing light to it. Yeah. You're asking the question. You're making the comments. I think it's awesome. Did I tell you that how, how great this is, Liz? <laughs> Did I tell you how great this is to be with, like, we're just hanging out. Just hanging out. I just want to take a moment for anybody that's just listening and not watching. If you could see Liz right now radiating the smile uh, and your emotions, by the way, Liz, moments ago, I saw your eyes welling up a little bit. I get this experience, this full emotion of Liz. And I also want to tell you Liz, in the middle of the interview, I'm breaking the flow here and I apologize, but I have to tell you, I'm with Jeff Gamboa last week in Florida. We're talking about you and we're just having this great moment celebrating Liz Dialto's life. And I want to tell you that you inspire so many. Speaking of being a great friend, speaking of lighting people up, speaking of being somebody that I admire, respect, look up to, um, you're a, such a powerful force. This feminine energy, your your posts, your Instagram, your your life online, both cracks me up and it inspires <laughs> me all at the same time. It's so cool. Thank you. Uh, just you sh sharing your love, uh, you know, um, for your, you know, like I said, we were commenting before we went on air today about your man going on this great adventure and. You know, I think you just talk so openly and proudly about your relationship. And I just want to tell you how, how meaningful it is for me. So speaking of peers providing uh, great insight to, you know, into your world, you've been somebody that um, has been really important for me. And thank you. Ah, oh, thank you. You're so good at that. So uh, this is the flow. You can't possibly interrupt the flow on the show because that's what it does. It just goes all over the place. <laughs> It's that that's the thing. It's called Untame the Wild Soul Woman. That's going to happen. Yeah. So um, months ago, you interviewed me. I had the honor of being one of the first interviews on your podcast. And for somehow my parents who don't ever even listen to my podcast listened to yours. They listened to that episode and I get a voicemail from my mom <laughs> and she is like, call me back i wanted to thank you for something and i'm like oh what is this and i call my mom which by the way this voice that i create is a parody of my mother this is not what she sounds like but she's like oh so your father and i were listening to that podcast that friend of yours really loves you your father was crying his eyes out <laughs> When that guy was introducing you because he just said so many nice things about you. But I guess there was something you asked me in the show, like some piece of advice that came out of my mouth that my mother went off and used. And she was like, that really works. <laughs> so so this is great. This is like this this symbiosis or however you say that word of, of your right. Right. Like the friends, the people in your life, the people around you. Um, so thank you. I really appreciate that. You said something uh, related to this about you know, just be careful because sometimes the, the input, the feedback that's coming from your peers is so well-meaning, but not necessarily that helpful. And I think that's because there's a great power in objectivity and the people who love you the most are not objective at all. Mm -hmm. So as a coach yourself and as someone who I know who's done so much growth and coaching work and received that, um, can you talk about maybe the difference and the nuance between getting advice or input or feedback from your friends and actually working with a professional? Yeah, I, 
when when it's a friend, there's so much context that's already been created. Yeah. There's so many dynamics at play that there's you know there's something beautiful about the first time you do anything the mm. first impression you get from somebody when you meet them um you know sometimes we become numb to expressions that our friends have or words that they use because we've heard them so many times um that's just our brain gets good at filtering out noise as a protection mechanism for ourselves and so we that naturally happens and I'll tell you, I'll, I'll, I'll answer that question also with a story of yes. explaining um, how this shows up when you know somebody well. So a couple of some, two summers ago, I'm with my son, who's four at the time, and we're at the park. And he sees this rock wall, 35 foot high rock wall that he wants to climb. It's like a carnival. like a, And... I'm trying to encourage him to go ride the roller coaster because I don't think there's any way on earth he's going to climb this wall. So he's like, I really want to climb it. And I'm like, ah, let's go over here to do the roller coaster. And finally, I cave in. I go back and he gets harnessed up and he surprises me climbing 30 feet up on this wall. I'm blown away. And right when he gets to this part of the wall, Liz, where the wall inverts out, it literally like this negative climb. Uh, I, I'm thinking there's no way he's going to get past this part of the wall. This is like the expert part, part of the wall. <laughs> and sure enough, right in that moment, he gets to that part of the wall and he looks down at me and he goes, Papa, I can't. And I look back up and I go, it's OK, buddy. You tried. And right then, which I think I'm being like this great coach in that moment, the guy who's working the rock wall turns to me and says, I think your boy could do it. <laughs> <laughs> and then he looks back up at my son and goes, hey, buddy, try again. <laughs> and, and Tiger looks at this man with this newfound confidence, grabs the wall and makes it to the very, 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 very top. Now, in that moment, the lights go off and we're celebrating and he's fired up and he comes down and he's like on fire. And what I learned that day, Liz, was that we often treat people that we know like we remember them yesterday. Oh, my God. And not who they've become or even more who they could be. And so in that. I think that defines why the difference between somebody who knows you, loves you, cares about you, providing advice, and somebody who's a coach who might have a bit more of an objective. Now, they're coming to the table with some type of frame of the world and their blueprint, of course, and you know that you always get that. But, but I do think that we oftentimes will hold back a little bit with people that we know. Um, and, and so... And, and then when we don't hold back and we give what we think is the greatest advice, it may or may not be. So I think it's good to experiment. I think that family is valuable, friends are valuable, coaches are valuable. I mean, I'm gonna spend this year 25,000 bucks on coaches that hopefully have an opinion uh, that will be refreshing for me. And here's the interesting thing. I'm surrounded by coaches. Yeah. That they'll coach me for free. I mean, my best friends, Hal Elrod, you know, <laughs> yeah. John Berghoff, like some of the greatest, Stacey Martino. These are world class coaches that would jump on the phone with me, and they do, and they're valuable, and they provide great insight. But there's also a layer beyond that. And I think it's fun to explore. So we, we pull out quotes from every episode. And what you just said, we often treat people we know uh, like we remember them yesterday. That is, this is, we have, t today, we posted our 81st episode yesterday. Oh, congrats. And thank you, which means I've probably done, because we have many batched, 90 to 100 of these interviews at this point. Mm. That's one of the best, best quotes, best insights ever. Like, I felt that one explode in my solar plexus and then just go everywhere else in my body <laughs> because, and I do, I think about Michael because, you know, something he said to me last week, he's like, other people are so much more excited to see me than you are. And I was like, yuck. 
because they don't see you every day, you know? Like, mm. you're right. But that was like an invitation for me to be like, oh, how can I be more excited to see you? Like, bringing that newness and like the fresh eyes and like remembering like all these things that other people are not taking for granted when they see him. And it's, that's mm. not just with your partner, but like anyone in your life. And I love like how simple was that? And I totally loved your impression of the carnival ride guy that was like, I think your boy can do it. Like, <laughs> Thank you, yeah. stranger. Like, yes. Yeah. Ah, so good. And the guy and the guy next to me is like, so that's your boy. What do you do? And I'm like, oh, I'm a motivational speaker. <laughs> <laughs> right. right. And, and there's probably been a point in your career <laughs> when you've quoted Yoda, as we all do. There is no try. There's only do. And you were like, you tried. <laughs> uh, yeah. And you know what's interesting is that when I reflect on that also, Liz, I can actually see... When I'm being totally honest, yeah, there was a part of me that was like, yep, I was right. He couldn't ah. make it up there. I was right. I wanted to own, like I wanted to be right more than I wanted my son to be excellent. Oh man. What a great so my my coach that I'm working with this year, her name's Siobhan, and um, she talks about this all the time. The need to be right. Mm. It's a concept. I'm still it sounds obvious, but it's not because there's just like that. That was really subtle. And if you weren't as a, a, like aware of a person as you are, you probably wouldn't have even noticed like that in that moment you had a need to be right. And what is trade off needing to be right more so than your son being excellent. And this exactly. is what we do in our life all the time. These various things like I have a need to be right that I'm not good at technology. So guess what happens to me all the time? Technology glitches all the time. So like I'm, I'm letting that go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, so good. So what is going on for you right now where um, you are kind of – what's uncomfortable in your life right now? <clears throat> Writing this book is highly uncomfortable. <laughs> now, you just went through this process, right? So uncomfortable. I couldn't <laughs> believe it. You just went through this process. Now, I want to turn the interview around and start asking you a bunch of questions about what you went through um, because I am feeling totally uncomfortable with this process uh, for a number of reasons. One, one is the, the, the little voices creeping into my head. What do I have to say that hasn't been said by anybody else and said better, perhaps? Um, you know, my friends are going to have all backed me. Everybody's getting excited about the book and then they're going to all be disappointed and I'll lose friends over this book. Oh, this book is going to equal loss of friends. <laughs> and this is the, this is the, the, the game I play with myself, you know, uh, so 10 years of the front row foundation and all this amazing stuff has been done. And then I'm going to disgrace it all by writing a book. It doesn't do it any justice at all. It doesn't honor the people that helped build it and the recipients that we've served. There's all this crazy doubt. And, you know, last year I did a lot of mindfulness work uh, with, a, with a coach, uh, Juliana Ray, who I've also had on this show. And she had been kind of in our network and working with people that were great friends of mine. Um, if, if I weren't so aware presently, <laughs> I don't know that I would actually be able to articulate these emotions as much as I am, but I'm fascinated by how this brain yeah, is working yeah. right now in this process. Um, and that's been interesting. That's been scary. Um, so I also ex experienced similar things, not, not so much the loss of friend thing, but what's so interesting is we can take what you said about others, right? We treat people we know the way we remember them yesterday and put it on ourselves. Bingo. Right? Because that's a, I'm giving a bunch of thumbs up if people aren't watching this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because – and this – I also yesterday interviewed my friend Giovanni Marsico, who's the founder of an event I love that I want you to go to next year, Archangel Academy. Hal's probably been on you about it as well. Um, we're talking about superpowers, and we're talking about how often our superpowers – we have no idea it's our superpower because it comes so naturally to us. We assume that it comes naturally to everybody else. So, like, there's just no way that you could possibly disgrace. I thought – I was thinking the same thing about my book. One of the things that I did was I just – I wanted to keep it very short, digestible, and simple. And, in fact, 
couple months after my book came out, my friend Rochelle's book came out. I've been reading it and I, having these feelings of like, oh my God, Rochelle wrote the book I actually wanted to write. And it's like, <laughs> crazy. no, right. she didn't. She wrote the perfect book for her. I wrote the perfect book for me. And then, and then and just the messages you get and the things even because I only released the book initially on Kindle. So now I'm like going through some edits and stuff. To, it's at the printer. It's going to print and it's coming out May of this year, 2016. And I'm, I'm looking back, and for me, I'm like, this stuff is not profound. This is not a big deal. <laughs> like, meanwhile, this thing has over 100 reviews on Amazon, most of which are five-star of people being like, this changed my life or this truth. And right. I'm just reminded of something our friend Rosa said when we were with her in Maui in December, which is like there's a difference between informing people, which is just sharing information, and educating people which in a lot of ways is reminding people what they already know. Mm. And so just waking something up, mm. sparking something. And, and you and I know this because we're avid readers. We have read so many books. We have heard so many people speak. We've gone to so many events. We have consumed so much information. There is a lot we already know, but we don't remember it. We have forgotten totally. more than we consciously presently know and are using in this moment. And so Absolutely. all it takes is the right person at the right time when we're at the right level of receptivity or need for that information. And so many people are going to get that out of your book. So many people mm -hmm. get it out of my book. It's going to be something they maybe have heard 30 times already. But the words you use, the way you said it, yeah. and that current energy of the situation is going to be so perfect. And, and we cannot ever account for that. We just can't possibly know. And the other thing is, in this wild world of social media, of all the people who do like and comment and share things, there's probably three to ten times the amount of people that aren't doing that because that's just not how they roll. Like, we'll never be able to measure our impact. So mm. we just get to kind of trust, you know? Yeah. I'm going to take that last 60 seconds and I'm going to listen to that every morning yeah. <laughs> as I sit down to write this book. Uh, so, so true, Liz. Uh, you know, and I... I think what's great is you, you, oftentimes as coaches, what, whatever we promote, whatever we share, the stories, the lessons, we're helping people, sometimes turning that on ourselves is difficult. Uh, I'll give you a great example. When you, you referenced a minute or two ago, superpowers, right? And that sometimes I think you said uh, that they're so subtle that some, or that we, we've embraced them that we don't even recognize them. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yep, yep. So Tiger and I, my son, for those of you who don't know, uh, six years old now. Coolest child's obsessed, name ever. <laughs> is obsessed with superpowers. And yesterday we were having this conversation and he thought, um, or he, he had this uh, uh, spy pen and you would write and then you'd have to use a, a, a black light in order to see it. That's cool. So he wrote a love note on my hand and then I grabbed his arm and I wrote a note on his arm and then he grabbed the decoder pen and flashed it on his arm and it said, uh, you have superpowers. And that was the message I wrote to him. And, and he smiled immediately and then he went, but I want real superpowers. Like I want, I want to be able to shoot webs out of my hand. <laughs> and I was like, hey buddy, just remember that your greatest superpowers are the words that you can speak you know, the look that you can give, the love that you can provide, the questions that you ask, like those are your real superpowers. And I suppose that should have been the advice I was giving to myself in that moment and not putting enough um, credit to those superpowers that we do have. So yeah, a lesson for all of us, including everybody listening today, is to embrace your superpowers. Embrace your superpowers. And I'm so glad you said what you just said because I don't know if I've ever told you this before. But and I actually still remember where I was standing when you said this to me. I was standing next to the building of the guy I was dating at the time in Baltimore, Maryland. And you and I were on a coaching call. And you said something to me about um, the best coaches – ask people the questions that they need the answers to. Mm. And that has become one of my superpowers. Mm. That is something, and even in this podcast, that I'm just honing constantly. And it is one of the most fun superpowers and one of the biggest gifts. And also gets me off the hook of needing to know answers even. 
because I don't need to know the answers. I can ask the questions. And you yeah. gave me that gift seven years ago. Wow. Where does life go? Wow. That's totally nuts. I know. It's, it's moving quickly. And so these moments uh, are important right now. Oh, my God. So fun. So book is uncomfortable. Yeah. Oh, my God. I just... And then, you know, it was funny. I don't know if you're doing this at all. When I was writing the book and it was so uncomfortable, I was like giving myself shit that it was that uncomfortable. Like, mm. why would I think that something should be easy for me that I had never <laughs> done before? <laughs> Who do I think I am? Uh, right, right, right. <laughs> exactly. That's yeah. so funny. Yeah, I see. And I see clients of mine do that with problems in their life as well. I, rem you know, we we're good at reminding others and sometimes reminding ourselves that our problems aren't real problems. You know, the, not compared to the real problems of the world, like the problems that I'm facing with writing this book. I, I'm, and then I start beating myself up for that, too. <clears throat> like, come on, John. You know, you're being so selfish here. Just write the book and focus on a real problem in the world. Um, it's it's amazing what our inner dialogue, uh, what amazing what happens in our inner dialogue throughout the day. You just brought up something that I've had a blog post or something brewing on for a while, and and I've been just like nurturing it um, carefully so I can choose language that's helpful because it's a little bit edgy of an opinion, and. Mm. Um, it is this, that first world problems are totally valid. I, I find it so interesting um, how people want to do what you just said. People want to go, well, that's not a real problem. But I really believe, like, if I live in the first world, and so the things that are problems for me are problems for me. It might not be a problem for somebody else, but I just don't believe that there's hierarchy of problems because everyone's experience is different. And I find mm. it so interesting, like I'll post something on Facebook or Michael will post something on Facebook. And sometimes, you know, someone wants to be like, you know, check your privilege. Like this, if you lived in the third world and the thing is like, but I don't. And I'm not talking to people who live in the third world because that would actually be grossly irresponsible of me because that's not my experience. And don't mm. you want someone who's like been in the environment and been in the trenches and like knows what's up and knows what's going on versus someone who has no freaking idea what it's like to be that person? So I'm still working on it. <laughs> <laughs> this is, this is some, uh, some passion there. I, I wanted to hear you keep going with that. Hey, you know, what's interesting is I, I can tell you neither one of us projected or that would even have expected that we would go down this road probably no, on this call. No. But I want to share it with you. It's Untame, the wild soul. Um, Untame Yourself. What's the name of the book? Untame Yourself. Untame Yourself. Such a brilliant title. Thank you. So here's a thought, Liz. Um, the thought is that I don't think we can measure good deeds. This actually ties into what you're talking about. So one time a friend came to me and said, John, how do you put people in the front row of their favorite live event when there's people around the world that are dying because they don't have access to clean water? And I said, that's a really good question. So I'll respond like this. If if we compare almost anything we're going to do today, including what we're doing right now in this conversation, having breakfast, I'm referring to the guy and myself at that time, nothing's more, about, nothing's more important than saving somebody's life with clean water. About anything that you'll do today is not, in comparison, more important than saving somebody's life with clean water if it was literally like you had to make a choice right now. You could do the thing you're about to do next or save somebody's life with clean water. You could do this podcast interview or save that person's life. You could have your dinner at your home tonight or save someone's life with clean water. You could do, you, if you compare it that way, just about nothing you'll ever do will be as important as that. Now, if that logic is trying to be played out, this, you know, if, this, if I'm taking this guy's logic, we should all stop everything we're doing and every single person should go try to fix that problem uh, until that problem is fixed. That would be maybe one approach that somebody could take. But I, I like to believe that we're all put here to do something. There's a big puzzle and we're all supposed to put this puzzle together and we have these gifts that we're supposed to bring to the table. And I think that, you know, somebody's supposed to fly the plane and somebody's supposed to teach the classes in school and somebody's supposed to build the, the parts that will then build that well. And some people are designed to go and install that well. And some people are meant to do this and that and this and that. And we ultimately all make the world a better place. But I say when you try to play out or measure good deeds, um, that's almost impossible. Yeah. And I said, you know, it's like 
Bill Gates. You know, we give sometimes we get so wrapped up in saying, I want to change the world like Bill Gates or Mother Teresa. We use all these big examples of great Martin Luther Kings. And we set this bar so high that it's like if, if you really want to be important, you have to be a Steve Jobs. You know, like that's yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's really you have to be an Elon Musk. You have to be a, a whatever. And I think, well, here's the thing. We can't we never know how big the ripple goes and we don't know the yes. people like your social media is that, look, Bill Gates. Yes. So grateful. He's doing what he's doing. Right. Wonderful. Love it. But I'd also say that there's a person who answered the phones tonight. Suicide hotline saved someone's life. It could perhaps be a brilliant genius that goes on to solve the finds the cure for cancer. We don't know. We don't know who does what that creates what ripple that creates some positive good in the world. So you cannot measure good deeds. You just need to find out what lights you up, you know, identify some problems in the world that you want to solve and then go do your piece of, you know, and do the best you can do. Um, I, and and I, I know that people will fight and argue against that. But that's genuinely what I believe. And I think that relates a little bit. It might be a far, it might be a little bit of a stretch to tie it back to what you were saying. But this idea um, that you brought up, Liz, about, you know, um, uh, comparing ourselves to third world, like that idea of comparing. Right. Right. Uh, and I agree with you. Pain is pain. And I think that... Um, now, I, I get we're, we're in on an edgy subject, right? Yeah, <laughs> like somebody's yeah. going to go, no, 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 no. Not that pain is nowhere near your pain. Right, right, right. But I don't I don't try to I don't try to pretend like I know what it's like. That's right. I, when I when I talk to students, I go, I don't I want to be going to pretend even though I was a student. I'm not even going to tell you that I know what it's like to be you yeah. because I was a student 20 years ago. And I don't know what it's like to be you growing up in yes. this school, yes. in your class with your body and brain. Like, I don't know. I don't know what it's like to be you. But but, you know, but <laughs> I will just simply say that it's important to embrace our reality, yes. do the best that we can do with what we've got. <sighs> Amen. So we were, we were just talking about like there's no hierarchy of pain and, and, and just how comparison in any context is basically the most useless you didn't say this. I'm saying this. Comparison's basically the most useless energy expenditure we could possibly come up with because it's never, you know, if we're playing tit for tat and trying to make things even and like it's just and largely with things that you can't measure, it's kind of useless. So uh, moral of the story, friends listening, uh, just comparison. There's that quote that I think gets attributed to Ben Franklin, but who knows if he actually said it or not. Um, comparison is the thief of all joy. Mm. Uh, Liz, I, I want to make a quick comment on this too. Two thoughts. One is, I, I I believe it's compete, don't compare. Like compete, yeah. The idea of competition in its greatest form of like everybody playing the game and elevating the game. Yeah, compete with people, sure. Yeah. Don't compare. That's that is that's where yeah that is that is where your life becomes miserable when you start comparing. And the second piece of this is, I just interviewed a guy, Matt Tenney who has an incredible story, and I'm not going to get into it, but it, it involved him being in prison. And Matt uh, was talking about how he only was miserable if he was comparing his current status of being in prison to, like, let's say he's brushing his teeth in prison, if he was comparing that to brushing his teeth at home. Mm -hmm. But the minute he let go of the comparison and he could just be in the moment, he found happiness. So he talked about this idea of letting go of these comparisons, but that our brain wants to constantly do that. We're comparing this against that, you know, and we're constantly comparing. Um, but I think that's a that's a that's a whole we could write a book on that. We could write a book on that. <laughs> and speaking of books, um, what is the front row factor? So the front row factor is the story of the Front Row Foundation. And it is the exploration of people's journey from the back to to the front of their life, the back row to the front row, where they go from a spectator to a participant. Mm. And this is a book that is about proximity. It's about what do we put ourselves in proximity to? You know, the thoughts, what, what do we hold in our mind? How close are we to these thoughts and feelings that guide us? Uh, the people in our lives, you know, who, who's in our front row, we like to say, you know, the surrounding ourselves with incredible people. And then there's what's in our front row. And this is shaping an environment 
that lifts, lifts us up. Um, we can create meaning in any environment. We just talked about it with my friend Matt. But the idea of shaping an environment that then lights us up. Um, when you walk into your house, you know, thinking about what lights you up about this house and how can you create a world uh, literally that lights you up. I mean, if you're watching this on video, you see on this wall back here, there's a, there's post-it notes all over. There's calendars. There's letters from clients. There's the mind map over here. It's creating a physical environment that lights you up. So three pieces to the front row factor, your mindset, your relationships, and your environment. And that's what we call living a front row life. So that's the book and I'm super excited about sharing it with our community. It's really, I'm writing this as a, a way to honor the 10-year journey uh, that's taken place, uh, the lives that have been helped, those volunteers that have helped us to do this, and everybody that's played a role in figuring out this life philosophy that now people take into their day-to-day -day activities. You know, they talk about living life in the front row is one of engagement, you know. So no matter how many days we have on earth, we can make the most of those days. And we'll say things like, you know, it doesn't matter what seat you've been given in life. You can always choose to have a front row experience because sometimes, let's face it, you know, the 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 cards that were dealt aren't the it's not the best hand. Um, and we also it's an empowering book about if you don't like your seat, change it. Yeah. But if you can't change it, then you just own it. You just own your experience. And that's the essence of the book. I love what you just said. Um you know, something I'm always inviting people do to do is to not be victims, right? Like your your current situation yeah. is not your permanent reality. And 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 so what you just said about like if you can't change your seat for some reason, just own it. Like just be yeah. there. Like there's always something to enjoy about where you are if you'll just put a little more effort into looking for what is what is right or good versus what is wrong or doesn't feel so great. So um, I like to do some rapid fire questions at the end, only my version of rapid fire tends to not be so rapid because I love tangents. <laughs> <laughs> so I always set out to like have it be rapid fire. It never goes that way. So I need to think of another name for it. But um, what are you reading right now? I know you're a voracious reader. Oh, can I turn around and look at my table? I've got, oh, you know, I'm reading Will It Fly, um, Pat Flynn. Oh, cool. So, uh, yeah, I'm going to have him on my show tomorrow, um, which I'm excited about. Um, reading Sacred Commerce, which is the story about uh, Cafe Gratitude. Oh, cool. Um, reading a book uh, from Michael Port, who is a new friend of mine. Um, so, Steal the Show and Book Yourself Solid. I'm reading both of his books right now. And Presence by Amy Cuddy which I'm a huge fan. I don't know why I find it amusing that you're reading a book called Presence as one of five books you're currently reading. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, here's, here's what I've gained from this. So here's your quick tangent. You know, I, what I've gained is that, you know, this idea that I used to believe you had to pick up a book and finish it from yeah, start yeah, to finish. Yeah. I no longer buy that. You know, it's just yeah. like I pick up the book I want to read that morning. I read, I skim and dip. That's my strategy. Yes, 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 I skim. Yes. And I dip in where I want more insight. So sometimes a book will capture me beginning to end. But uh, most of the time, I'm, I'm searching for nuggets. Yeah, I love that. I do the same thing. I'm usually reading like three to five books at once. And I notice I'll put something down for like months at a time and I'll come back. And whenever I come back, when I open it up to where I was, it's like pff, something. I It's always something I needed like yeah. on that day, in that moment. So that's one of my favorite like divine interventions and synchronicities of life. Um, where are you going? You have any trips planned? Like, uh, fun trips, not business trips. Fun trips, not business. Ooh, uh, my wife's trying to talk me into going to Russia right now. She's going with our kids for two and a half months this year. And so she's, she's talking me into heading over there. Um, uh, fun trips. Uh, gosh, I have literally my calendar. This is like one of those moments where my calendar is packed and I don't even know where to begin telling you what's fun because it's <laughs> a lot of it's business, but it's also it's also fun. And you know what's so weird? I when I asked that question, I was like, ah, the two are not separate in this conversation. So whatever yeah, you want to say. It is really. So, uh, it, well, here's my one of my next big trips is I'm going to be at the Quantum Leap Mastermind Group with Hal Elrod and John Berghoff in San Diego. Right after that, we have our speaker trainer experience at San Diego. So we have a week of uh, fun. When are you going to be in San Diego? Um, that is March 22nd through 26th, something like that. So yeah, I'm going to see your face no matter what. Um, That's awesome. I don't need to crash your event, but I will come see you wherever you are. 
Awesome. Well, we should talk. We have some, I don't want to say it right now on the air because if it doesn't happen, but we've got something going on that night that you definitely, definitely want to be a part of. So okay, it'll cool. be fun. Um, yeah. yeah. So just that kind of stuff. But I will tell you this, I just got back from a trip um, with Tatiana, uh, not just got back, but recently we traveled and we had a great time together. We went to Amsterdam and Paris and it was just a beautiful trip. Uh, that was really uh, just a wild adventure. So that was that's the one that keeps popping up into my mind. Oh, cool. Uh, what was the most fun thing you did while you were there? <sighs> the most fun thing? Biking in Paris. We, we went on this big bike tour, and it was just fantastic. We laughed, and we saw the city, and it was just this gorgeous day that seemed to all line up perfectly. So I'll ask you one more question. Under the topic of untaming yourself, which untaming, you know, a lot of people hear me say that and they think they need to like go naked, barefoot, screaming in the woods. It's not what it's about. Untame is really just coming back to your true nature. So it's like very unique. It's very different for everyone. For some people, it looks more, more calm and peaceful. For some people, it's like a bit more, I don't know, however you would describe my way of untaming myself. But um, what's yours? What is something... Um, maybe something I didn't ask you or maybe something you just love to share on that topic to wrap up. So let me just make sure I got the question. It's about how I untame myself. Either that or anything under this topic of untaming yourself that like I didn't ask you and you wish I would have, or just something that you really feel like you want to share on that note. Yeah. Um, I want to say to my, my advice or my thought or my heart immediately goes to get around Liz, Elizabeth Dialto. Sorry, I almost slipped up. Elizabeth Dialto. And I almost said Liz. I almost said Liz. It's, and, I'm, not, I'm not like that upset about it. You know me okay. as Liz for over a decade. I'm not going to be like, it's Elizabeth now. Get it right. Uh, I, I would say stay in your camp. I really am a huge fan, and that's I, I know that sounds like it was all a big setup for me to say follow Elizabeth Dialto, <laughs> but it's not. It's just the truth. It's what I really believe. It's, I think that you have to surround yourself. With, I mean, I'm writing a book that talks about the power of, of, of peer group and, and surrounding yourself with amazing people, and I think that you're one of those people, Liz. It's the reason we're talking now. It's the reason we've been friends. It is the most important decision we make and our, one of the most important decisions we make in our lives. I think that what friends friends oftentimes help us do is to let go of stuff. You know, it's like that analogy of, of, a, of a statue being revealed. It's what's chipped away. It's not always what's added on. And I think that when we learn something, there's also a question of whether or not we're really learning it or we're revealing it. Like when we learn something, it's like, oh, that's awesome. Of course. And it's like, that's because you're not learning it. You just had a little light shine on what you already knew to be true. What you're doing is you're recognizing truths. You're not learning something. It wasn't removed from you and then you got it and brought it in. Mm -hmm. You just illuminated something that was there. That's how you saw it. So the way I see that is somebody comes up to me at the end of a speech that I give and they go, John, that was awesome. Man, you are amazing. And then I say, wow, thank you so much. I, I believe we see in others what we see in ourselves. And I think that when you untame yourself, what you're doing is you're recognizing truth in yourself. You are letting go of a lot of the layers, um, you know, that are sometimes very thick, you know, layers that have been, you know, attached to you over the years uh, because you've made these agreements because somebody what you, seven years old told you to stop singing and, you know, at, at 12 years old, somebody told you that you're you're supposed to be this or that. You know, 13 years old, somebody told me they thought I had a learning disorder and that I wasn't good at reading. And I owned that until I was 25 when I finally said, what if that's total bullshit? What if I'm great at reading? And then next thing you know, I am. And that no longer controls me. So I think that untaming yourself and really living uh, what I would consider to be a front row life is all about letting go of stuff revealing your true character like you said um and then living in that and and the the big that one then when you feel that you've gotten to a place where that's happening then the hardest thing is keeping it because as soon as you get there it doesn't mean the work's done it's like because stuff just wants to attach to you and create more layers and you have to just be finding ways to chip it away and that happens sometimes when you're sweating at the gym literally when you're doing mindfulness training, literally when you're on vacations, you have glimpses of truth. 
glimpses of what really is makes your heart sing. And then the, the more glimpses you get, the more that you can condition that in your brain and your heart, the more that you can spend time with that, the easier it is to be there. So that, you know, again, I'm quoting a bunch of people and I don't even know who to quote, but where the brain fires, the brain wires. And it's like the same thing um, with, with the way that our bodies operate. Um, so it is literally about, it's a practice. It's just like, it's a practice. It's a process, right? Fall in love with the process. That's how you do it. You totally get obsessed with the process. And, uh, and then you stay around Elizabeth D'Alto. Oh, my God. <laughs> The answer so, is Elizabeth Dialto. The answer is me. Thank you. <laughs> uh, your check is in the mail. <laughs> just kidding. Um, oh, my God. I love you so much. I'm so excited to also have just found out that I get to hug you in a couple of weeks. Um, Front Row Factor. What's the website these days? FrontRowFactor.com. Great. FrontRowFactor.com. If you want more John Roman in your life, and why wouldn't you at this point? Let's be serious. Thank you so much. I just so... It's just so great. I, in this moment, feel a bit overwhelmed. I might cry by like just how fortunate I am to have people like you in my life. Mm. Liz, thank you. Big hug to you and um, can't wait to see you in a couple weeks. Thanks for having me on. Yeah. And th thanks everybody for listening today. If you made it this far, um, thank you. And uh, I just appreciate uh, this time, you know, these moments. I hope that my kids, Liz, will look back on these videos and know their dad and know who was important to their dad. So oh thank you. So um, if you're listening, uh, I want to know how you what, what came up for you in this interview. Go to our Facebook group, untameyourself.com forward slash Facebook. Let us know. Let's keep the conversation going. And uh, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. We'll see you later. All right. Adios, Liz. How do I define my spirituality? Does it have a name or is there a particular tradition or few that you identify with to some degree? So something I identify with to a certain degree is Gnostic Christianity because it's basically just, I mean, if you had to describe it in a couple words, it would be that God is love. You know, that everything in the universe is available to all of us and that, you know, source, creator, Christ consciousness, however you want to label it, is, is really rooted in compassion, kindness, love, generosity, and abundance. And so um, I also would really define it as self-trust, like really, really deeply trusting yourself, listening to your own inner wisdom, connecting with that, and really your inner wisdom just being the way the divine speaks and communicates through you.